Okay, we're going to learn some cool things today. I, um, I'm excited about these next three chapters for this reason. I'm going to tell you what we're going to learn over the next two weeks out of three chapters. And uh, when I do that, here's what I'm going to do. a set the stage for the next basically uh, two and a half weeks. And here's where we're going. We're going to answer a number of questions uh, from the field of psychology, uh, including some things we're going to cover. You don't necessarily have to write down what I'm putting up right now. It's just a summary of what's coming. You may certainly write it down, but you're not required to write this. I just want to show you. Anybody have a, want to take a guess at what's the most common sensory disorder in the world? We're going to take a guess. Think about it for just a minute. The most common sensory disorder in the world. Think about it for just a minute. Some of you might know it. The taste of foods. We're going to talk a little bit when it comes to sensation about how for taste, they're almost exclusively, by that I mean, a large percentage of what we think might very well be tastes are nothing more, or actually are more aromas than anything else. This one will demonstrate a little bit in here, um, and we'll talk some about how we know this and what that means for people who do not smell things, what, how it affects their uh, sense of taste. We'll look at some optical illusions in here, including um, perceptual adaptation, and we'll talk a little bit about something called ESP. That is, is does it work? Is it there? Uh, in fact, I'll do a demonstration in this class, as I mentioned before, of um, what some might call ESP, and I'll tell you now, it's kind of a magic trick, um, but others have used similar kinds of tricks to show evidence that they are able to communicate using extra senses, and we'll talk a little bit about what psychology has found related to our abilities to understand the world or sense the world without using our normal senses. So sending a message from one mind to another, is that even possible? And we'll talk about what psychology has found and what the research shows. We'll look at the oddness of sleep. How many in here love to sleep? And, and, yeah, yeah. Everybody. Sleep. And, and we'll talk about why is it so fun to sleep? what's the um, kind of power and allure behind it, and then we'll talk about why this is such a mystery, because bottom line, there's a lot of good research out there on the topic of sleep, but it turns out that the greatest mystery still may be trying to answer in a simple way, why do we sleep? Why, what's the function? Why do we need it? We do know this. We know it serves the brain. And that is uh, very important, but it's not the full answer. So we'll spend some time looking at awareness, consciousness, what happens during sleep. Um, and so that, so, there's, so some certain questions we're going to be discussing over the next couple weeks include these. Are there energies in this room that we are unaware of? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to answer that question? Any energies in this room that we're unaware of? What would be some things? All right, radio waves. Are there radio waves that we're not picking up right now? Yeah. Most of you are not. We're not attuned to them. Have you ever heard of somebody who's gotten a filling in their teeth and now they pick up a radio station? That's probably not likely, but you have to know. Yeah, all, any kind of like light waves, ultraviolet or infrared uh, waves that we just don't see. In, any kind of, yeah, there's other kinds of, uh, other extreme measures, radioactive waves, yeah. Yeah, there's certain kinds of um, temperature things that we may not be aware of, including things that, for example, even at, the, at, at infrared, you can still pick up some sources that way, but sound waves, uh, ultrasound, ultrasonic, or any kind of thing. Now, are there any other particular energies, maybe in this room? How many believe that there's possibility of spiritual presences in this room today? Is it possible that there are angels in this room? Well, we say, as Christians, the likelihood of us being surrounded by that, we just point back to biblical evidence. And it seems as if it's very clear. There are spiritual beings, including angels, that are present, right? What does that mean when we say God is present? Can we, how many have ever 
Well, I can ask this question, I think I know the answer, but we can start with this way. How many of you all, and I might even put this on a clicker here, uh, are aware of, that you've seen an angel? Anybody here seen an angel? Not common. Anybody felt or s sensed the presence of God very clearly that he was saying or speaking or impressing something upon you? That one. A lot of us have felt. Is God, now how did he speak to you? If you said you heard God or felt his presence, what does that mean? Does it mean that there was, yeah, go ahead. Through a vision or a dream? Or through, it, 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 for you it could have been through a vision. Uh, in, in, during a dream did you say, or just? It's weird to explain, but yeah, it's fine, yeah. yeah, it's happening. And a lot of times, how many would say, if I asked you to, and I pressed you on it, did God speak to you? Did you have a vision? Where was it? How many would say, it's kind of weird and different and it's hard to explain, but I know clearly this was God talking. All right, what does that mean when we try and explore presence of a spiritual being? If we simply believe that is true, can and do they ever reveal themselves to our senses? Well, seems as if there are, besides the sound then and the electronic or electromagnetic light waves, the presences in this room that we're unaware of, like angels or humans. So we're going to talk some about the human brain basically is attuned. Our senses are able to pick out a fairly small spectrum of energy. And there are a lot of things that occur outside our awareness. We know animals, of course, that can pick up some of these energy waves that we cannot. Um, so we'll talk some about what this means. And then there are some mysteries we're going to try and solve in the next couple of lectures as well. First of all, anybody know of a cell phone ring that cannot be heard by adults over the age of 30? <laughs> I'm going to show that to you in about 15, no, I'm going to play it for you in about 15 minutes. The cell phone rings that I cannot do. Because I'm 31, and I just, <laughs> last year, I lost them. I went, oh, man, stink. Can you look at something right in front of you and not see it? So let me give you an example of something that's right in front of you, and you can look at it, but you don't see it. How many of you <laughs> She said she was looking for her phone today and it was in her hand. That's really funny. Any examples of something you could mock already? By the way, I think the implication is this. We can, and I'll show evidence, that you can have something right in front of you, looking right at it. Your eyes can be looking at it. In fact, we can hook up cameras to look to see where your eyes are looking. And in fact, you don't ever see what's in front of you. How could that be? That is really weird. My lecture today could be something that you're looking at and you don't ever see it. Is that possible? Yeah. You could read textbooks and be thinking about something else. We talked about that. So we're going to show evidence of this. And then, is it possible, and evidence has shown, ready, that subliminal messages, messages played that we are not aware of because they are below that awareness, that they can actually decrease shoplifting in stores. Now that, you want to take just the same kind of information from chapter one that we talked about with skepticism that says, for example, is it possible that subliminal messages can cause people to not shoplift? Is it possible? And what does that mean for us if something that we're not even aware of causes us to change our behavior? How many heard of messages subliminally being placed in like commercials or on internet sites that you can kind of pick up something or in songs that are there. And that, so we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. And that's a mystery that there is indeed evidence that subliminal messages decrease shoplifting if they're put into music that plays throughout the store. But science has shown that these messages don't impact behavior. And so there's more to it. It's more complex than that. Last um, is just a brief overview, and we're going to go into the topic. Yeah, that was Carolyn, she's little. We're going to go into the topic of sensation. In order to answer these questions, we do have to look at the basic concept to talk about things like vision, hearing, how the eye and ear works. We'll talk some about the chemical senses 
and uh, ultimately we're going to start with some basic concepts. So, let's start with the first one um, today, and that is a very important um, phenomenon called inattention blindness. Inattention and blindness is just what it says up here, the idea that we can look but not see something, the fact that we can listen but not hear something. This phenomenon is exceedingly familiar to most of you. We have already talked about you can do some things and, for example, listen to somebody's name that you just met and what would happen. Well, the possibility that not only did you forget their names, but did it ever really truly imprint it, 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 uh, come into your memory. So if you've heard somebody share their name and you've forgotten it, what happened to that information? How is it possible, and is this kind of why we would say it's possible to look at something but not see it? So this is known as inattention blindness. What's important about inattention blindness is that it has some very important implications because if you were to direct your eyes at something, just by common sense we would say that that information, if we watched you looking at something, we would assume that information is going into your brain. And the interesting thing is it is going into your brain, but then inside something is occurring that is allowing it to escape. And it doesn't imprint itself. It doesn't stay there. We don't process it. So inattention blindness is this best example is, I'll just show you an example. How's that? Okay. So, here's what I need you to do. This is going to be, some of you have seen this, and don't tell your neighbors if you have seen it, just let them experience it. All I want you to do is to count the number of passes that a team, how many have seen it? Maybe half, so don't tell the other half. There's going to be two basketball teams. One of them is going to be dressed in white, one of them is going to be dressed in black. You're going to count the number of passes that are made. Now, we're finding there could be gender differences as to who picks up more of the passes and who doesn't. So try your best to count the number of passes and we'll see if there's a difference in what people can see. So, ready? Here we go. This, this is, is an awareness test. <laughs> How many passes does the team in white make? Team in white, count the passes, the team in white. Okay, how many? The answer is 13. 13. Watch up here in the middle screen. Did you see? Now watch, let's play movie. it again. We'll rewind it. <laughs> There was a moonwalking bear in there. How many saw the moonwalking bear? Here's the middle screen. Watch my pointer. Right there. Uh, how many got the 13 right? And how many did not, if your hands up, did not see the moonwalking bear at the same time? Or how many did you get Okay. Is it possible that you just directed your eyes at something on a screen and you didn't see the moonlight bear? What's the explanation for it? Anybody? What, what, what explains the fact that that was clearly there? You saw when I rewinded it, rewound it, right? Okay, so you were focusing on a part of the images, right? And you certainly had the ability to see it. That's not the issue. You were just, your focus was elsewhere. Or priority. I forced you into, or they forced you into looking at something else. Yeah, and this is the interesting piece. When we look at something and don't pay attention to it because it's not that important to us, or we're thinking about something else, we will be blind. And that's what's called inattention blindness. Do you get it? That's the definition of inattention blindness. Anybody think about where this might have a practical effect when it comes to, for example, everyday behaviors? There is one that is huge that you have probably done today that has rendered you blind or in a, with inattention blindness. You drove in a car today or in the last week. 
drove, had actually drove the car. All right? How many drove the car and talked on the cell phone at the same time? All right? <laughs> Cell phones and driving are as interesting as if there is any one behavior that occurs in a car that is greater in as far as its consequences for affecting attention than, than alcohol, it's talking on a cell phone. I'll say it one more time. It is easier to be distracted and more oftentimes deadly, more consequential to talk on a cell phone than it is to have a certain blood alcohol level of, let's say, 0.08, which is the legal limit for driving while intoxicated. You do better on driving tests when you have a 0.08 blood alcohol level than if you're talking on a cell phone. Ooh, great question. How is it, then, that there's not evidence that somebody's sitting right next to you who's doing the same thing, talking and having a conversation, how come that doesn't affect accidents as much as talking on a cell phone? Do you want to know the answer? Yeah. Yeah. Ready? Friday. I'm in a car. Driving. I'm not driving. I'm the passenger. We're driving up on a major freeway, and the driver isn't sure if to take the carpool, this exit, to the left, or to stay on this way, and there's a divider, and he's got to make a decision. The car ahead of us that we were following didn't know what to do, and he eventually went left, and so this driver went, ah! And him and I are having a conversation about something. Well, what was the what was the difference? By the way, if he was talking on a cell phone, he had a four times greater chance, well, what we call 400%, increased by fourfold his likelihood of getting an accident in that case. The difference was something that I did as the passenger. What did I do as the passenger? See, I'm in that car, and I go, like that. So I basically went, and I stopped talking. And he went, like that. Now, if I'm on the cell phone, what do I not do? I don't know what's happening. I just keep talking. Here's the explanation. You have a greater chance of that 400% increase in accidents due to talking on a cell phone because of something called competition between the auditory and the visual senses. You see, this competition is occurring if you're sitting on a cell phone driving and there's a visual something happening in your visual field. In this case, visual information isn't fully or processed as quickly because the auditory demands a lot of your time and energies. And so here's what's happening. If you're talking on the phone, while driving, that what do you not have in front of you when you're versus, let's say, with a passenger? What else do you not have that a passenger gives you that a cell phone person doesn't? I just told you that they see something that that is the passenger can stop talking in a dangerous situation. But what else does the driver not have? Yeah, the driver doesn't have access to probably the most powerful channel of communication. Most of our communicate, look at this. If we were to sit here and have a conversation, you and I individually, the majority of your information about, the, about this conversation is going to come in through nonverbal channels. Facial expressions, body position, tone of voice. Um, you can read emotions from me. My words make up probably, some estimate, that's around less than 7 or 8% of what is the message, what the message is. Words, the actual content is maybe as little as less than 10% of the actual message that's being delivered. The other 90% is coming in nonverbally. How much does this person agree, disagree with what I'm saying? They're nonverbal, do they like, dislike what they're hearing? Um, all of these other channels, and on a cell phone, you don't have access to that. You have some tonal changes, you have some uh, content changes, but you're actively trying to hear this, and we call this competition, um, auditory versus visual, as one of the leading causes of the increasing likelihood of accidents. So 400% increased likelihood of having an accident. That means you're four times greater talking on a cell phone than if not while driving a car. I don't know the difference in, in accident rates 
based upon, let's say, gender? It's a good question, and there might be some evidence out there. If you, it, it could be related to this. I just don't know the numbers, so we can maybe look and find out. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. It's not all that different. He, he asked this question. We, we talked earlier in this class some about the study of information that goes in and how do you communicate with, let's say, fighter jet pilots who have to decide uh, certain things, like not only how to fly the airplane, but their mission that they're accomplishing, or information, let's say, if they're being, you know, a, a missile's heading their way. There is still what we call processing that has to come in, and they fight the same thing. The brain only holds on to certain kinds of information, so it's not all that different. Now, in this case, um, a very, I think, revealing study was one in which they put students just like you inside a driving simulator. Anybody seen or heard of these car simulators? You get in, and it's just like driving a car, except you never leave the room. It's just a simulator. And so they put people in, and they had them do this. Ready? They just had them drive for about five to ten minutes. And they just went for a drive. They, there were certain things that, you know, it felt very realistic. You know, you stop at stop signs. You know, there are turns you have to make, different things. And there were billboards along the way. These individuals got out of the simulator, and they were asked this question. Did you remember seeing any billboards during your 10 minute drive? And they would always say, oh, yeah, I did. I remember seeing there these billboards. And they had a, a recollection out of 10 billboards of like eight of them. Kind of like that they were there, they recognized eight, they may not have known exactly what they were saying, but they saw somewhere in that neighborhood. Then they took another group of students, had the same exact experience, same drive, except they were on a cell phone, and someone was talking to them. And then they got out, and here's what they said. At the end of the study, they got out and they said, yeah, how about the billboards? And almost everyone went, oh, there were billboards? I didn't see, I don't, I don't oh yeah, maybe I remember like, oh, okay, they, they, they have a recall of like two billboards out of 10. But here's the twist, ready? There's a camera. <laughs> in these simulators that focuses on the eyes of the driver, and in each case, the driver's eyes did this, looked up at the billboard. So as they're driving, all 10 billboards, they looked up and saw while they're on this phone conversation, and they didn't even recall seeing a billboard. <coughs> you see, that's the problem. That's where the auditory overrides what? It overrides the visual. So this processing, this is why accidents with 50% less recall on a cell phone is the exact way in which this competition between the auditory and visual plays out. So, in this case, it's just evidence that there's other studies that are showing that it's not, for example, what some people believe, that accidents occur because you're holding a cell phone or talking on a cell phone like this. That doesn't cause an accident. You're gonna get a ticket. If you're like this on a cell phone, you get a ticket. But you can always argue, look, this isn't dangerous. Holding a cell phone doesn't make you dangerous. It's not the holding. So therefore, if you put it on speakerphone, if what I just explained, do you think speakerphones make, make driving better or less risky? Yeah. It has nothing to do with physically holding it up. But this state, for example, many other states outlaw holding a cell phone, but you can still have a speakerphone. Is there a certain age you can't hold up to 18 or something? 18, 18. Well, I mean, all, all that to say, they're not going to find any evidence that handheld is, uh, or not handheld is any safer. Because it has nothing to do with the it. It has everything to do with the process. Does that make sense? You ever watch, I'll show a video sometime, if, if we have time, about people driving and how bad they are talking on cell phones. Um, cool studies that way. All right, any questions on? on the notion of what we call inattention blindness. All right. Yeah. That's a good question. A lot of researchers like us and people who have done this kind of thing, his question is why would they even pass this law? And the law, the idea is to stop people from talking on cell phones. That's a, that's a good law. The problem was it, it, it cell phone people and other other companies fought this quite a bit and said, well, just the problem is they're holding it. That's what's distracting the drivers. And so it, it really just was just a law that, you know, they passed and sort of a compromise thing because it really 
ultimately doesn't come down to that. They probably didn't consult some of the research findings as clearly as they could have. All right, good questions, anything? All right, how about this one? What's the mystery cell phone rings uh, that adults cannot hear? By the way, it, you don't have to write down a lot of this coming up just for this next slide, because it is interesting, but there are some cell phones that I, rings that I cannot hear, and it's simply because the frequency or the pitch, uh, what we call hertz, is different. And when, I, when we're communicating, most human communication takes place in a certain range. Um, I have that listed up here from 200 to 8,000, what's called hertz, and that is this speed at which these um, sound waves travel. And what's interesting is, for example, if, is, it, is there any no middle C? Right, anybody over there, no middle C? No? Oh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Piano, if you put middle C, it's around 250 hertz, and you can kind of get a sense of what that means. Now, cell phone rings are one way because they can be set at a higher level outside of its normal range, and older people won't hear it because of deterioration or what's called an aging ear. So this middle ear, as soon as you get older, you'll start to find you're unable to hear at the extreme levels certain sounds. And this is known as aging ear, which, by the way, is the most common sensory disorder in the world. <coughs> aging ear, the inability to hear sounds at an highest pitch level, is what's called the most common sensory disorder in the world. Because everybody over the age, certain age of 30 begins to have this. It just happens that way. And so, I'll give you an example. Are these called, what are the names of these? Mosquito rings? Have you heard that? Yeah. They're very annoying, but here's the cool thing. I don't even know they're annoying. <laughs> but would you like to hear the differences? Yeah. Yeah. Here's how it works. Um, and here's how it works. Um, so here's 8,000, what we call hertz. Uh, I know, it's really bad. Now that, is within the normal range of human, and I can hear that. But I, I'm not sure, that's the high end. I've never heard of anybody communicating at that level with their voice. But that's the high end, supposedly, of human communication. Ain't that one good again? Okay, then here's 10,000. Yeah, okay, now I heard this. By the way, quick story, I'm downloading all of these files at these hertz. Well, it gets to a point here where I can't hear them anymore. So I don't even know if I'm downloading anything. <laughs> so I'm downloading something, I go, ah. And so my daughter, she's seven, and she's, well, she was like six or five at the time, she's sitting on the bed, and I said, hey, Caroline, um, do me a favor, can you hear this little sound? And I would download and play, and I can you hear that? She goes, ooh, yeah, I can hear that. And then I do the next one, how about this one, can you hear that? Ooh, yeah, I can hear that. And then I started start thinking, maybe she's just saying yes every time I say, can you hear this? So I messed with her, I go, who can you hear this? And I didn't do anything. No, I don't hear that. <laughs> so I don't think that works out. And then after a while, I started downloading, I didn't say anything, I just would play it. And then she'd be sitting there. I could still see her on the bed, just messing with, you know, she's just sitting there going, hear it. <laughs> hear it. <laughs> so I knew I was working. All right, that was 10,000. Ready? Here's 12,000. Let's see if you can hear it. Nice. I can hear that. That's bad. Now, here's where I'll just tell you where I am and where you continue. I don't hear this one, but ready? How many hear that? A anybody not hear that? Any anybody my age? <laughs> yeah, okay, I can hear it. I'm just pretending. All right, 15,000. Ready? Can you hear this or not? How many hear it? Anybody not hear it? Okay, I'll try it again one more time because I can't hear this. Because it, is, it is playing, right? All right, ready? Ready? 15,800? Anybody not hear that? I don't know. 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 This is really annoying. Ready? 16,000. Uh, How many didn't hear that one? There are a few of you in here that didn't hear that. I can tell, yeah. About 20 of them. One more time on 16,000. Did not hear that? All right. And then 17,000, ready? 
Ooh, wait, one more time, I'll play it again. By the way, before I play it, I, I still remember a couple of you in, here in class, you ran into somebody else, we were at this place, and they had this mosquito ring, and they were saying, oh, you can't hear it. I remember saying, there's no way I can hear this. And he, he played it, and I, I don't hear that. And so it's a, I still remember that. Ready? One more time, 17,000? I'm going to hear it. I'm going to hear it. Oh, I'm going to get that here. We lost a few of you. You have older ears than some other people. Okay. Cell phone rings. Or any other sound. That some people can put in so that junior high and high school... However, I, I've heard of high school students doing this and they have young teachers who can hear it. And how many have had that experience where your young teachers heard this and other So it starts again decrease with age. Um, so something to look forward to. Question. All of this to say there are certain sounds outside normal ranges, there are certain sensations outside that we just don't pick up, and then there are some that are borderline that some of us don't pick up. Question, yeah. I don't think it's damaging. Uh, that would be a try <laughs> if it would be, if we just added more damage to your hearing. No, I think it's most, mostly, I don't think it's the pitch, the hurts that's necessarily as damaging as is the, the, the strength of the sound, how, how loud. Um, okay, in this case, we're now going to introduce this mystery that I talked about, and that's this mystery of subliminal stimulation. Science? has shown us evidence that subliminal stimulation, messages that are presented to us do not persuade us. They don't change our behavior. And yet, we have evidence of decreasing theft rates at stores that install music, speakers, and everything else that play songs that have built in subliminal messages that say, for example, don't steal, don't steal, don't steal. And the theft rate in these stores goes down. Yet science finds no effect. Anybody know how we can answer the mystery? Scientists aren't finding any effect. The stores are maybe interactive with their... Maybe stores are doing something weird. Is that what you're going to Well, just the fact that they're playing music, maybe, or the tone of the Happy or sad. Yeah. Sometimes even just the music itself, or maybe they're playing. Um, you've heard of some people who at some stores that will play like songs that they realize no young kid would like to listen to and they'll drive off because they don't want them there loitering or whatever. So sometimes just the music itself could do something. If the store is willing to go that far, they probably already have Good question. What's going on about the store already. Maybe there's something inherent in the store that's causing this difference. And that's, you guys are heading in the right path. Yeah. Maybe the area where the store is. Or maybe there's some differences in the area. So one of the things you'd have to do is set up a, an experiment between two stores that are in like the same area. Right? That maybe have the same death rate. Because otherwise that can explain it. Now, how then, or how is it then that if a department store plays songs with a subliminal message in them, i.e. don't steal and shoppers are not aware of it because they don't process this message, the store will still find this decrease in shoplifting. As an example, you can, just to show you, right? Here's a song that you can play. Now, you can play this, and that's what you hear on these speakers. Okay? Good song? Old song? Ah. Right. The song that's going on, now, I can put something in this song, and you're not aware of it, that says, don't speak. Don't steal. Don't steal. While it's playing. Right? That's the only thing going on in these stores. Question is, <laughs> why does a department store, and here, here, here's the very basic setup. Here's the mystery. Let's say this is store A and this is store B. They're in the same areas, same city. They're both the same store. Let's say, I don't know, give me the name of a good store. We can do this. <laughs> we'll do a Marshalls. How many said Marshalls? Nobody. Is that even a store? <laughs> Alright, let's get a better store. Mervyn's. Is that a store? No, they're out of business. Macy's. No, they're out. 
target. Here we go, target. Ready? Target store A and target store B. They're in the same basic city, same type of people come to these stores. Uh, and here's what would happen if we went to this store right here, and if you let me take this store and install speakers, install speakers, put in a stereo system like that, and say, let me play this song or these songs over and throughout your store, and inside of these songs, I've, I've put in this little message that says, don't steal. As we watch a track, if you look up here, we will track something like this. The store theft rates, we can watch them over time. And let's just say they kind of vary back and forth every couple of weeks, up, down, up, down, whatever. This is story. Store B, we just leave as our control group. Ultimately, here's what would happen over a four-week period in this store. Let me go in, put it in, put the speakers, play the songs, and here's my theft rate. Ready? This store B will go just like this. It'll stay. We didn't do anything different. Store B over here. Store A will go like this. The theft rate will go like that. Now, science is telling us that messages that come in that we're not paying attention to, that we should be, the perfect, perfect, perfect example would be subliminal messages, they don't persuade us. Yet evidence is showing this, a big decrease and block in shoplifting over these two, three week periods that we're testing. Okay? Now, how do we explain it? It is related to inattention blindness. It is related to a factor that, or, or, or a variable that's related to the experimental situation. And you do know the answer from things we've talked about in this class. Because by the way, this is known as what kind of what, what, or what uh, research, or I'm sorry, what findings would we have? What type of findings? That when shoplifting goes down, when we play more subliminal messages, yeah, it's known as a correlation. In this one, it's right. It's a correlation that shows as we play subliminal messages, our rate of shoplifting goes, and that's called a correlation, right? Now, the correlations they don't imply what. Correlations do not imply causation. And so they force us to go this, to answer this question. What is it that's causing the decrease in shoplifting if it's not that? And some of you are starting to say it's the store or security that they're doing. Here's, I want you to be thinking about it because there's a simple answer. In order to get to that answer for the next 15 minutes, what I want to do is just give you some real basic concepts so that we can answer the mystery as we go through this. But here's the concept that we have to know. What's going on with our senses in any type of when data, when outside energies, when these things hit us? Well, what happens is stimuli come into, in, into the brain and we detect it using our senses. And it's this detection process that we call sensation. Your sense organs detect stimuli and they transform that particular sound or that touch or that visual into something called a neural message, which we've been talking about in here previously. This neural message is something that your brain is now familiar with that which was on the outside is now on the inside. We call that sensation. That which was on the outside now goes into and is turned into or transformed into a neural message that your brain can understand. And that's the only way, by the way, your brain can do this, if you turn it into. I, you can take, you know, if somebody had, their brain was exposed because they were in surgery and they were, you know, doing something, you could yell at that brain all you want or shine lights on. The brain will not hear or see anything unless it's a, turned into a neural message. That's the job, and what we call sensation, of these encoding or transforming receptor cells that just simply translate this message into something the brain can hear. Perception is that part in which you take this transformed message and you organize it. So perception is taking this neural stimulation and trans well, 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 we call organizing it and interpreting these messages. Okay? So this is chapter five and chapter six. We're going to spend time in chapter five trying to explain how we detect stimuli. Chapter six, how we organize it. 
and how we interpret it, and why some things like ESP, or why some things that are like perceptual illusions occur. And they occur because our interpretations are different. Okay? We're forcing people with illusions to see something, and their brains fool them by a different interpretation. So, when this smell of this rose, for example, the uh, aroma goes up here, it strikes the olfactory bulb. At this moment in time, detecting it, that rose, is this moment right here. When you, detect, detecting that something is there, a sensation, when you say, ah, it's a rose, that's the moment perception has occurred. Does that make sense? Knowing that you're smelling something is sensation. When you smell something and then you go, oh wait, that's a rose, that's the moment perception occurs. Very quick, and we're gonna slow it down. This is what this chapter five and then this chapter six. So we're gonna spend some time looking at some real basic content. Questions? So where we're heading? We're gonna try to answer this mystery about how subliminal messages work, because we in order to do that, we have to go through some of these very quick uh, basic concepts. This is known uh, as a necker cube. You can see how many can see this the cube there. Um, if you see this necker cube, um, it could be uh, it perceived in a variety of ways. How many can look at that necker cube and have it sh change shape? Or, or, so it looks like it's just changing its orientation. And that can occur with any necker cube like that. And then this is also interesting because you can see this maybe as looking at a necker cube from, let's say, a piece of paper with holes in it or it's out in front of, and so it could look like this, ready? It could be floating out in front, like this, or it could be floating behind, like that, or your brain can go back and forth and come up with different interpretations. So if you're seeing the exact same stimuli in different ways, it means your brain is organizing and interpreting things differently, even though the sensation is the same. Does that make sense? So if that's the case, Perception, then, this interpreting process allows you to take the exact same stimuli and see it or call it something different. Ah, how does this play out? Historically, people have been fascinated by this very question. How does the outside world get in here? How do we take the world out here and turn it into something that we understand. And that's been historically a question that we've asked. Um, there have been different views on this, and just real quickly, real early on, uh, researchers, uh, but more even earlier before researchers, you had just simple people who would ask this question all the time. Some of the first questions that Plato tried to answer were related to this. How does this outside world get in? And he even speculated that it was this notion of what he calls imperfect copies of the ideal. And so if you took this right here, put a object in front of you, like this, you can identify this object very quickly. What is that object? Chair. Well, how did Plato said, well, the way you did this, the way you figured out that that was a chair, is that in your brain you had some sort of what we called an ideal. You had a chair in your brain, an ideal, and you looked at something, and even though it doesn't look exactly like this chair, it's an imperfect copy, you could still go, oh, that's a chair because you made this kind of connection. And this view, by the way, we held on to forever and ever, a long time. Plato's view of this process was this. And by the way, it was known, we call it today, as naive realism. A naive realism is the idea that because this is so effortless and so fast, this type of realism that we would go through is just part of us. It's effortless, it's automatic, it's reliable, it's fast, it's unconscious. We don't need to instruct anybody to do this. And because you didn't have to teach anybody this, the idea was, oh, it just happens. Because if, if I hold up something like this, you could say, what are these? Real quickly, you'll say keys. Well, this isn't exactly what your key looks like, but you have an ideal in your brain, and you can match it up and go, oh, yeah, that kind of fits. That's a key. And we get through our world that way. That's what Plato said. And Plato was what? Plato was wrong. Naive realism isn't 
the way your brain compares and looks at things. Instead, you do something way more awe-inspiring than ever imagined. Do they know what you do? For you to tell me that that was a chair, or for you to tell me that those were keys, or for you to tell me that that's a car, or a person, you are doing some amazing work. You are actually taking what's called and constructing the perception from the ground up. There's both what we call bottom-up processing and top-down processing. Your book talks about this. I'll let you read it. But the most fascinating, fascinating finding is this. You take your perception and literally reconstruct every bit of them. And sometimes you'll know this when, when people, by the way, have little problems in this construction process, weird things happen. Have you ever seen somebody, by the way, you're very good at looking at other humans and determining their gender. Just like little Andrew was in class when he looked at somebody with long hair, even though it was a boy, he still said that's a boy. You see, you're, but when there's a problem with it, like have you ever seen, for example, somebody and you didn't know their gender? How many found that a little bit like, I've got to know what they are? <laughs> and you maybe even followed them around <laughs> until you can determine their gender. Well, don't do that. No. But see, we have now learned there are so many steps in this constructive process, we don't have to think about it. But when there is, for example, errors like some people have strokes. Strokes have damaged a certain part of the brain of some people. There's a guy, ready, who has a particular stroke that damaged this part of the construction and the perception so that when it comes to identifying faces, like of his family, he can't do it if they stay still. If you put his wife in the room right here and had her sit down, he would not be able to pick her out of, he would be able to pick her out of anybody else because Part of this construction that we do involves this one little step that involves us to identify faces. And he can't see the face of his wife until she smiles or says something. And then he goes, oh, that's you. Yeah, that was Some guy has another area right here. Part of his brain, he does this. He believes, for example, that humans, you do this real quickly. You look at an object and you can tell me if it's human or not. Now, that is a very important gift. We don't even think about it. It's effortless, it's automatic. But this guy had a stroke in his brain, and now he actually will see somebody like his wife and try and put his wife on his head because he thinks that's his hat. <laughs> Penny Oliver Sacks wrote a book. You know the name of that book was? He studied this man. The man who mistook his wife for his hat. Every time he'd see her, he didn't know it was a wife, and he thought it was his hat. He, didn't, he couldn't identify an object because a piece of this construction went wrong when he had this problem with his brain, and so now Oliver Sacks went out to study this very powerful thing. So here's what happens on the constructive perception. Ready for that? <laughs> Many of you all said, ah, it's going to be right. Do you know how amazing your construction was? By How many did not know who he is? He plays basketball. He's really good. <laughs> Ready? Don't be right. But the speed at which you identify, let me just give you a taste of the construction. This is where it's awe inspiring. Ready? We have a hard time getting computers or robots to do what you just did. Put a chair up there. You said chair. Ah, computers can do that. They can even identify some objects like this. But the speed and the effortlessness by which you do this really truly is something. Ready? Here's what you had to do. There is a special circuit inside your brain, I'll tell you what, from this point for the next two seconds, you're going to have to write this down if you don't want. I just think it's amazing, the construction. First of all, there's a circuit that only analyzes the shapes of objects. And so you have circuits that analyze only shapes. You have some circuits that do nothing but detect the presence of motion. Some of those circuits work exceedingly well. And most of these work well and effortlessly, but then other ones detect the direction of motion. Which way is somebody moving or some object? Another circuit judges distance. So you can see here, let's say in this picture, Kobe Bryant is right in the middle of trying to dunk a basketball. There are circuits in his brain that are telling him how far away that rim is, how um, the distance, how, how much his hand needs to go up or down. All of these things are occurring because of some very powerful constructive perceptions, color, 
we, we'll analyze different colors very quickly, very, and, and there are just circuits that do that. Others that identify objects as human or non-human. We have other circuits that identify things like, how did you know that was Kobe? What did you, how many knew that was Kobe by looking at what part of this? His face? Maybe in, in, in conjunction with the face, the uniform? You can even see maybe how he walks or flies through the air and identify people. And you go, oh, that's Kobe. Well, all of these have certain things to them, but by the way, construction doesn't stop there. Once you do these little individual pieces, your brain puts it back together, and then there's higher circuits that check to see if it's a contradiction. So if something's not human, but it's moving, we go, oh, wait a minute, why is that thing moving? Or we will check contradictions, like something is so small, but they seem far away, that's okay, but if something is small, but they're close, we go, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make sense. Is this uh, an illusion? What? And so you check for these contradictions, you put all these circuits together, and in just the instant it takes to put a picture up there, you send it to yourself, and the, you're aware of something, and you say, ah, that's Kobe Bryant, and now you've seen it. Ah, all of that to illustrate that our constructions of the stimuli that start to strike our brains are exceedingly powerful, and they do an amazing thing of taking the world in a processing way. By the way, because it's effortless reliable, there's two types of processing I mentioned. Bottom up processing, it's like this, ready? Bottom up says you take something from the basic and you lift it by looking at the, the parts and like, kind of like I just described uh, in seeing Kobe Bryant. And so real quickly, I'll show you a picture. Some of you may not know, but who is this? Bill Clinton is, I mean, Al Gore. Bill Clinton and Al Gore, President and Vice President of the United States, many years ago, ready? But in a sense, this is actually Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton. It's the same person with a different hairdo, okay? It's the same face, Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton. We just put different hair on him, put him behind him, and bottom up processing. How many saw him as Al Gore? How many saw him as Bill Clinton and Al Gore? Anybody? How many, how many thought, no, it's the same person? No, it's the same so what we do is, very quickly, we make determinations using bottom-up processing. Sometimes something stands out to us, and other times we just go through very quickly and see this. The trade-off in this speed, the way in which you say it, that's a chair, that's Kobe, that's this, is we can be wrong. And the trade-off is accuracy. Most of the time it gets us through our world, we process it very quickly, but the trade-off is accuracy. Now let me show you something called bottom-up processing. You've seen an example, a better, uh, an example of parallel processing. You've seen this before, but you can read words that are out of order. How many have seen this before? According to researchers at various universities, this is easy to read, isn't it? It doesn't matter in what order letters in a word are. Why does it ma not matter what the letter of the words are? How does the letter, the order of the letters in a word are? Why does the order not matter? Well, that's right. The only, really only important thing is that the first and last letter be in the right place. It's because of what we call parallel processing. If you had to do only bottom-up processing, you would get stuck right here. And you would say, A, hey, that would be bottom-up processing, and it would be very hard for you. But we use parallel processing in addition. Your book talks about bottom-up, top-down, and parallel processing. All of this, sets the stage for what some researchers, some what we call psychophysics, and what it attempts to do is explain some of these different processing methods. Sensation re researchers and psychologists that study the field of sensation look at these types of processing. Psychophysics, by the way, is nothing more than just trying to explain how does this outside world get in? What happens? And there are a couple of key things. Thresholds are really big. How many remember the threshold for vision? Anybody see that in the textbook? Here's how they measure threshold for vision. Anybody know? A threshold means what's the limit? The guy who studied this, by the way, is Gustav Fechner, began a study of psychology by looking uh, with his brother-in-law, Boone, at introspection. And Fechner began to study how do people recognize or sense when something is there? How do you know an object is in front of you? 
When do you see it or not see it? What's your limit? And so um, thresholds were a big area of study. And here's an example of a human threshold. Ready? They're called absolute thresholds. An absolute threshold is this idea that you now can see something with what's called a minimum amount of stimulation. And you can detect it. It's an absolute threshold 50% of the time. So, an absolute threshold would be how faint could a stimuli be and yet you still see it half the time. One test of this would be a candle flame. How far away can I stand from you with a candle flame lit like this Let's say we turned all the lights off and I had a candle flame up here. Could you see it from the back of the room? Yeah, probably. Could you see a candle flame on a, let's say it's a clear dark night. Okay? A clear dark night and I had you stand, good line of sight. Let's say you were down in one of the dorms. Let's say you were down in Hope. If I stood up here and you were in Hope and you had a clear line of sight, could you see the candle flame on a clear dark night from here all the way to Hope? How many say, yeah, you should be able to see a candle flame? Now, how far is that? A half a mile? Probably not even, huh? How about at the park, directly across from the soccer field, which is, let's say, that's a good half a mile. Could you see a candle flame on a clear dark night from this spot that far away? How many think you can see it that far? How many say that's too far away? You can see it from. By the way, go one mile away. Let's say that was... Oh, I'll, I'll make it even harder. Ready? The Chick-fil-A, which is four miles away. Anybody think you can see it? Chick-fil-A, clear line of sight, candle lit, Chick-fil-A, four miles. Some of you, how many of you think you can see that candle? By the way, here's how we would do it. We take and simply have you trial. We do ten trials, and we go like this. Ready? See it or not see it? People would say, yep, yeah, I see it, or I don't very straightforward kind of experiment. Now, ultimately, when we've done this study, if you want to know how far away we've gotten, the line of sight, your absolute threshold for vision, that is for a candle, is actually 30 miles. 30 miles, you can be, which would be all the way from here to the ocean. Probably. We could get to the ocean in 30 miles, couldn't we? Sure we could. 30 miles from Viola to the Pacific Ocean, Take a candle, light it, and you can get right about 50% of the time. Now, are there variables that would influence whether or not you can see that candle? Certainly there are. And researchers start to explore things like signal detection theory. What's the idea behind you detecting a signal? What if I paid you? What if we did 100 trials? I lit this candle 100 times, and either I lit it or I didn't light it. We did it I gave you a dollar every time you got it right, would you be more motivated to see the candle? Yeah. You can walk away with a hundred bucks. The answer is yeah. You probably start to say you saw it all the time. But if I penalized you when you got it wrong, that would also influence the results. So signal detection theory says this. Absolute threshold means I could be 30 miles away some days. I might not be, I could only be 20 miles away and I couldn't see it 50% of the time. Because of what? What might be some possibility that would influence a human's ability to detect that signal? Maybe other light around. Okay, especially in this area, it's going to be very bright. It might be hard to see. We call that noise. Now, how many would say if you're tired, you may not? You say tired. If you're tired, it might influence you. Can anybody think of any psychological thing that might influence whether or not you saw that candle? I already told you motivation, money. What else? What might be some other things? Maybe you were, yeah, the noise we already talked about. Noise would be like light, for example. We talked about detectability. Um, that is, how bright that candle is uh, it influences detectability. And then any psychological state, motivation, maybe, yeah, some things like impulsivity, maybe, um, the ability to concentrate or pay attention. Um, here's, a, here's a psychological state that has influenced a lot of people when it comes to signals. I'll use one personal example. We went to our first and only scary movie when we, got for, when we were first married. My wife 
doesn't like scary movies. We went to a, a scary movie, and it was one of those kind where uh, there were like, you know, the, the music told you someone was about to get it, like, shh, shh, shh. <sighs> By the way, I can still do that today. And I go like this to Elise, there's like 20, and I go, shh, shh, just stop it. <laughs> and I go, shh, what? I don't know, shh, shh, stop. I mean it, no, that scares me. <laughs> and I go, oh, okay, that's all right. Well, it's because we're at this movie, first and only scary movie, it goes like this, shh, shh, all of a sudden, <laughs> someone's, yeah. <laughs> So we come home after the movie and we're sitting there lying, well, we're, we're lying in bed and it's like 10 o'clock. She goes, that was the scariest family. I'm taking movies like that. And then she's like, oh, did you hear that? <laughs> and at first I kind of thought it was cute. You know, she's real close and like, oh, like that. And then after all, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> do you hear that? Do you, you mean that sound like, shh, shh, She goes, yes. What is that? That's our refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it always been that loud? Yeah, it's always been that loud. What was that? I don't know, a leaf just fell off of the screen. <laughs> Are they always that loud? Yeah, I guess so. They're that loud. So she heard everything. So this psychological state influenced her signal detection, right? Practical application, put yourself in an airport, and it's now red, red alert, or red flag, or whatever those whatever they call them, and now people that are detecting dangerous people are now seeing things more than they haven't seen before. Agree? If you're a police officer and you've been shot at or you heard somebody's there, you're going, you're going to see more things than you have before. One, because you're paying attention, but your psychological state has influenced, and so signal detection theorists look at things like psychological states, noise, detectability, as things that influence, things that influence, their ability or something to to detect signals. Now, last point, limits. Limits are what we call thresholds. Researchers also study something called thresholds, what we call limits. This is cool. A guy by the name of Cicero did something called a two-point threshold. Can I borrow somebody's pen or pencil real quick? Okay, good. Can I borrow yours? Whenever you're done. Do you two more? Okay, so let's have, would you stick your arm up? Maybe we'll do yours like this. Can you stick your arm like this? What he did was, um, Susla went around and he measured people's two-point thresholds and he would touch people like this, ready? You can do this as well. If I touch you far enough apart with two points, you can tell the difference between if you're being touched by two points or not. But I can get it so close that your body, your you know, different parts go, mm, I just can't tell the difference if I'm being touched by two point or one point. It's called a two-point threshold. You can, he mapped out the whole body this way, basically. And he found some parts more sensitive. Your lips are very sensitive. If you just put them about a quarter inch apart, you can say, oh, I'm being touched by two points. But your lower back or your arm, not all that sensitive. And you can go like about a whole inch and a half away and not be able to tell the difference. Does that make sense? That's called the two-point threshold. So we'll try her. Uh, do me a favor, raise your hand. And either go raise it real high and either do a one or a two. And based upon what you do, I'm going to touch her, and I'm going to kind of vary the distance to see if she can tell. Ready? Watch. Look that way. Okay? You can just put it down. And I'm going to touch you with either one point or two points. Ready? Oh, wait, I messed up. <laughs> one or two. She says one. She says two. She says one. She says one again. Um, you can go like this. Start off at about an inch, and then you go down to a half inch, and you can start to map it out. And here's what was weird. Ready? Suslo did this. He tried to map out what he called two-point thresholds, and he found out that her threshold on her hand, ready, was, let's say it was one half of an inch. That is, when you got to half of an inch, she couldn't tell if she was being touched by one point or two points. She started to get it wrong. That's where I was. I was about a half an inch. You, you got two out of four, one out of three, or whatever. I don't remember. Is that right? About a half of an inch, which was your two-point threshold. But then he did something else. He found out one half of an inch is the threshold. He went to one quarter inch. He went below the threshold, and he said, pay attention. Try it. Guess. 
Now, he knew her threshold was one half inch. Then he went to about slightly less than that and said, think about it, pay attention, and now use your best judgment and guess. And when he asked them to guess below threshold, they often guessed it right. Do you see what he did? He went below their threshold, and they still got it right sometimes. He went, ready? Another word for below is sub. He went sub-threshold, or he went, another word is below their limit. Or he went sub-what? He went subliminal. He went subliminal. <laughs> He went subliminal, and he found that they still oftentimes got it right, which means this. It means that the brain is still picking up something that's striking you at a subliminal level below your threshold, such that if I asked you, ready, on the screen, do you see anything? Ready, on the screen. How many saw the word? Did you see it? That's because if it's subliminal, you it's not, it can't, it's not enough to get your awareness, and there's also no word up there. Jerk. But if there had been a word, if it was truly subliminal, and I asked you, had you seen it, what would you say? No, no it's below your awareness. But something that has flashed below your awareness still strike the brain. Does that make sense? And they still, we're going to answer this question, how does subliminal stimulation work? What's the science is find about it? We're out of time. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.